Okay, that's it. That's the show. See you guys. Good night. Good night. <laughs> oh my god. I can't watch that clip without getting the chills. And thinking about a the touring circuit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the, the <laughs> drip edge silver face dual showmans with JBL fifteen inch speakers in them. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, yeah, that magic, that magic, the magic sauce, the touring <laughs> reverb circuit. <laughs> if <laughs> the touring <laughs> reverb circuit. Man, hey I guys out there alcohol yet either welcome to the show glad to see you all i want to say one thing our posse is in effing sync if if ever there was a a posse that 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 drinks together the family that drinks together is in sync together and uh i'm uh i i'm i'm uh taste testing my uh, our home roasted uh ethiopian and a mexican espresso uh, espresso roast um good god do with, i need some of that right now with ice water um because apparently like a lot of you obviously uh hit it maybe a little too hard last night and so i'm kind of being kinda good right it. now so and there's a few of you out there water water with a ice chaser and, and it's hilarious so looks like we're all on the same page guys of course we're the malcontents but wait 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 brendan uh oh i didn't see what you were oh no 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 you did say huh. vanilla cherry pepsi with <laughs> the spicy beef noodle soup and cilantro i can do it so if spot. there's if there's if if anybody needs evidence that that there that the whole idea that there's some magic marshal out there that's got some special fairy magic dust anything it, that that is going to help you realize what he was able to realize that's the video right there. That's the one that tells you can look, watch it. He's levitating. He's not playing. He's not thinking about, am I getting the most, you know, am I getting the haunting mids and the, and uh, he's like, couldn't be any less engaged in what's going on behind him, except yeah, I can hear that pretty good. That sounds like no matter where I'm standing on the stage, I can hear myself because right, right, that right. was the goal there. That was the right. goal. The goal was, why did you use Marshall Stacks multiples of them? Because spread, the PA systems of the day couldn't accomplish that. Exactly. Uh, the uh, dispersion, wide dispersion. Marshall cabinets are beamy, so you put them side by side to spread the dispersion so that you can hear yourself on different parts of the stage. When you move, you don't disappear yourself. And the showman, the dual showman cabs, which were designed to be used vertically with the, the two speakers like this, they've got sideways with the speakers like this. Why? Dispersion. And they're too wide. They're two cabs wide. So they're even wider dispersion than two Marshall stacks, even with four speakers in each stack, because, uh, in the Marshall cabs, the, they're smaller speakers and they're rear mounted. So there's more cancellation. There's more, it's called um, a standing wave cancellation wow. in front of each speaker than in those showman cabs, which had a slightly thinner baffle, but it also uh, the, the way the speaker was constructed, the cone was flatter. Uh, it wasn't as V shaped. It was more like this hmm. and that helped with the dispersion also. And then that big wide metal dome in the middle of the speaker helped disperse, disperse the high frequencies as well. So they were just easier to hear. And those were the, like this I said, good the, nerd silver shit. Face, the silver face fenders with all the horrible things that just CBS did to what? 
make them cleaner, make them louder and clearer. They weren't like after a, any tone or any this or that. Right, they were right. after power and headroom because that was what was needed at the time. Mm-hmm. And so there he is. He's just using, he's like a, a whole spread of Fender stuff with with the JBLs, the JBL speaker, which was, was actually not, in, it was not designed by JBL. It was designed by a subcontractor of JBL. Um, it was originally designed. Well, it was designed by James Lansing. It was before there was really a JBL company. He was a design engineer. Okay. And um, the, uh, um, but there was a there was a shop that actually helped him realize the designs. They actually built them out according to his specifications. Uh, a company called Arnold Engineering made the magnets. And um, there was a, uh, a, a record producer named Harvey Gerst who was involved um, in the development, you know, a record producer. He was like saying, well, this is what we need and blah, 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 blah. And That's funny. Uh, ah. You know, they were like a little shop in Glendale. Yeah. And making these speakers ostensibly to, you know, be able to produce a better, more bulletproof speaker for guitar amplifiers because the amplifiers were getting more powerful and they need speakers. Right, right, right. And the rows. Right, right. Um, And that was really the, uh, the, 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 what do I want to say? The, the problem du jour, it wasn't about, you know, so much tonal concerns as it was headroom and just reliability. Yeah. And the reliability being, you know, a, a byproduct of needing more, you know, turning the damn things up because we need to be louder. We need more headroom. We need to be louder. We need to, because the PAs were inadequate at that time. And, you know, that was the main stuff. It wasn't about, you know, <laughs> like you said, the haunting mids and, and tweaking everything. Uh, PJ, that, that was not Miami. That was... Uh, the Newport Pop Festival from uh, 1969. So it wasn't actually in Newport. It was in uh, Northridge, California. <coughs> so uh, not that far away from Steve and I. And actually yeah. where the, the the show took place, it was at a, uh, a racetrack that um, no longer exists. It's actually uh, like campus parking uh, on the Northridge uh, College campus there. So... Hmm. Funny little aside. So a funny little story. I, I I had been I had been a drummer up to a certain point, and I started wanting to play guitar in bands. And I auditioned for this band. I didn't really have an amp. I had my little concert amp, but I didn't really have a real amp to play. Uh, in the the kind of band that I was auditioning for, which was like a B3 and a couple of horn players and a, and a singer and a bass player and a guitar player. And uh, I had a dual showman cap with JBLs in it and a Jaguar. Ooh. And um, uh, the guy whose rehearsal studio it was, he had a, he had a, a uh, hundred watt Marshall head. So I went Ooh. in there and I plugged that, guitar into that amp into that cabinet and the first thing the keyboard player who was the leader of the band said was can you do something about the sound of that (laughs) and even me not having any experience with how to get guitar sound listened to it and went why does everybody like these amps this sounds like ass (laughs) but i think everybody thinks that the first time they play (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Something like that. I certainly did. I didn't get it. I did not get it. I so did not get it. You know, but here's Hendrix playing an even treblier guitar. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, 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 what was the one with the big rectangular pickups? Was that the Jaguar or the Jazzmaster? I think it was the Jazzmaster. The Jazzmaster has the yeah, blocky ones. That's yeah. what I had. Yeah. Okay. And you know, those were fat pickups rel- com- compared to a Strat. A Strat, yeah. So here's Hendrix with an even brighter guitar and a fuzz face in and wah into Showman's. And you can hear that the treble is up there pretty good. <laughs> it's and, real good. 
and he's just positively levitating. He's like not. Well, you know, you, uh, you actually there's you had a little you you had a little backstory on that because he was playing. Yeah, that actual hockey. gig. Yeah, yeah, that that clip that we just showed uh, is actually. I think it was on the, you know, it was that typical kind of late 60s rock festival kind of setup where it was a, an entire weekend of, you know, big names playing. And uh, the experience actually headlined that show. And actually, it was it was the biggest uh, rock festival to date up to that point. And uh, if Woodstock hadn't happened, that's the big festival that we would still all be talking about. Because actually, there was a, it was kind of a big deal. There was a ton of uh, vandalism and, and property damage in Northridge after the show. And uh, so, what you're telling me is, is if the, if if it was rock and roll. Happened, if Woodstock hadn't happened, there would be no touring circuit. Is that oh my God, you're right. Wow. I think it's a, wrap your mind towards. around that. <laughs> Okay, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna continue with my story. So, uh, <laughs> so the experience. Uh, let, let's see. I think that show was was in uh, June of '69, and uh, they headlined the show. They were the big deal, and they actually came out. I, I think on the Friday night, and they laid an egg. Like it's, I haven't, I haven't heard any recordings of the show, or if I do, I forget. But you know, kind of the the lore is that they just kind of sucked, and they got paid a lot of money for it. And uh, Jimmy actually felt really bad about that. So he stuck around and he came back on the Sunday, which is that clip is from that performance. We came out with Buddy Miles on Sunday and just jammed and stayed for Buddy's entire set. Like, I'm going to show up and make this right. And I mean, the proof's in the pudding. You watch that clip, man. Like he came out swinging for the fences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And took yeah. everybody's head off. Yeah. So right. I, 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 I love, I, I, I love the whole idea of that and how it, how, even though that, and it's an incredible performance, just watching him play. And oh, watching so that's him, the whole thing is that's not his gear. Yeah. They didn't wheel out the Hendrix gear. He's like, I, I'm going to sit in with Buddy, whatever the hell's on the stage. This will work. I'm playing through. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah this will work. Yeah. I mean, what was he playing when he was Do doing one of these? The <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a full right hand sweep on a on a on a dual showman. You bet. That's the magic recipe for for something, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, if you say so. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, look at watch it, watching him just like unleash it, you know, and he's not turning around and humping the amp and no, 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 like trying to gas feedback or anything. He's just standing there going, let her rip. It's it, to me, it, it's interesting because uh, there are a lot of interviews where, you know, he would get asked about the playing with his teeth and the lighting the guitar on fire. And I remember he'd always say, you know, I just do it by feel. Hmm. You know, if I feel like goofing around some night, I'll do that. If I feel like standing there one night, I'll do that. And in that clip, yeah, it looks really cool from a showmanship perspective. But you can tell it has nothing to do with that. He's just ascending. He's gone. I mean, who knows what he had consumed before he went on stage to kind of help him get there? I don't know. But uh yeah, he, he's on fire. Uh, uh, what do you think? <laughs> hey. Brandon. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so uh hey Eli, welcome uh from Detroit. That's uh great to have you here. Simon a you see yep. Uh, DT popped in for a second. Point. I'm sorry. DT popped in for a second. David Torn was here for a brief moment. Oh, oh. and uh, uh, get to the gear. Your uh, thank you uh, for that compliment about about the uh, the Pitbull um, uh, module demo. I think you're talking about. Yeah, um, that that was um, when Synergy releases a module, or uh, when they release our modules. I do these little impromptu 
uh, feature set descriptions, and I just run through them. It's very informal, as you could see, from beginning to end, how it works, what the signal path is, salient things they need to know. That really wasn't intended for public consumption. That was for the sending to the YouTuber guys to bone up on what mm. the module is and how it works and what's behind it and you know what what the controls are intended to do and blah 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 blah. Yeah. Which is all the more hilarious when you watch those demos and the guys go, okay, well here's the six band boost. <laughs> and so what I'm doing is I'm turning up the six band boost and I got all the bands boosted now. And you look really closely in those videos and there's the switch that tells you when the EQ is on and off. And no. it's off. But the guy's like really? going up and down on the sliders going, and here's the boost. It's, it's You can hear uh, it. You can hear it's it. It's graphic equalizer. It's not boost. <laughs> and by the way, nobody can hear what you're doing because it's turned off. You know, I mean, so oh, that's what's man. hilarious about that little that little video and it sat around and molted for a while. And I, and I realized that I still had it laying around and I thought, you know, with a little tiny, tiny, tiny bit of editing to get some of the real dead space out of it, it might be really instructive for people that are thinking about getting the module or have it and don't like sort of really understand some of the, the intricacies of using it. So I would, we decided to publish it and Joe kind of polished it up a little bit and then we let it go so i'm glad that had uh i'm glad that landed with you i think a lot of people did judging by the the viewership of it it's like going it's getting pretty stupid numbers for a nothing video so thanks i'm glad uh i'm glad that you found that helpful and um it took uh, exactly the amount of time that it took to film the video to make that video yeah. that's the best kind of video <laughs> tech death hip tech death hippie Acid. Acid, yeah. Maybe it kills COVID. I, something has got to kill COVID. It certainly isn't the vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't that a lot of fun? Uh, no, it's not. I don't like it. Uh, I'm going to drink more Guinness. Yeah, really. So, the reason we convened here this evening was not just to watch Hendrix clips with you guys online, but to actually answer some questions. Yeah, we just sort of use that as another excuse to 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 sort of underscore the general consensus that the the well, I think we made our point. So, um, you want to do question time? You want to get to them? Yeah, I've I've got the uh, I've got the couple of the, that were were commented on on the uh, Facebook page. You want to? Well, but but wait a minute, wait a minute. It needs to be official. So hold on, everybody. Very important. We always have to have a second. You are for it. Okay, there, done. Okay. <laughs> As you were saying, you had Facebook questions. So Shima says, uh, generally I find it interesting when you're getting nerdy about the different guitar amp design philosophies of different manufacturers, including physical details as I am an electrical engineer. E.g., the comments you made last time about Peter Diesel and how his amps compared to yours were very interesting and entertaining. I know that this is not a specific question, but would help me to understand the real mojo, but also discover the marketing fairy tales. And finally, great show. Keep on the getting nerdy. Okay, so it wasn't really a question, but when, is he asking a question? Um Did he want me to comment further on the Diesel thing? I don't know. Peter Diesel and I are old drinking buddies. He doesn't drink anymore, uh, but we're still old drinking buddies nonetheless. And uh, we have we have a little bit of a, a a thing about sort of being in the same sort of plane with regards to uh, design ethos and stuff like that. And he's very uh, he knows exactly what he's doing and why he's doing it and why he wants to do it that way. And he's, you know, he's got a reason for everything, which is what you should have. 
uh, yeah, he takes else, the why else, why else exist? Yeah, he t he takes the OCD thing to an extreme that um, is beyond where the territory I would go into. Partly because um, I get if if I get that deep into it, I start losing my perspective on what I was trying to accomplish in the first place. He's got um he's German, first of all. That's mm -hmm. half of it right there, that that insane focus Culturally. on pre precision, you know, that that German design and, and execution ethic is uh is um it can also it can almost be counterproductive sometimes because if you have if you've got that much of that in your head i don't know to me it's, you know, the the work he does is beautiful inside but then i look at all he went to all that effort and he's using flywheel fly wires on the tube sockets and pots with all the pots that are like in the herbert for example there's you know uh 30 40 fly wires on the pots in there like that's the perfect scenario for all the work that he does on his meticulous, super refined circuit board layouts. It's tailor made for mounting the pots to the board. And he's technically proficient enough to be able to do that without having any fallout from, uh, you know, mechanical issues mm -hmm. that people often relate to board mounted pots mm -hmm. and yet he uses fly wires and i and i find that like okay i know peter why he, so why did he use the fly wires did did he think he that wants really, to he wants to but why does he want to does he want to do it because he doesn't want to hear about it from people why did you why did you pc mount them instead of do it with the right way with fly wires and and, and uh which is to me not the right way but Something motivated that, and I never really ask him. I just think that it's hilarious that he goes to all this ex extensive detail in doing a board layout, and then oh, what I'm gonna. We should have him on right sometime and ask. That would be okay. really interesting. Actually, I'll call him up. We'll get him yeah. on. That would we'll be grill awesome. Him. We'll grill him, and he'll grill us back. It'll be great. That'd be really fun. Hmm. I love that kind of thing. Like anybody who's obsessed at what they do, I want to talk to him. That's fun stuff. <laughs> don't buy a Germans tend to over design stuff in my experience. Don't buy a Beamer or Mercedes unless you hate money. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Huh. Uh, um, Do you have another Tyler, what's the next question? Tyler Bowley on the Facebook page. Um, Tyler. Okay, let me be the first to leave a question. Obviously, from your amps, you recognize the usefulness of more EQ tweakability by including a graphic. Are there any outboard EQs you can recommend? I'm thinking of trying. Okay, so basically what Tyler is asking, is there an is there an outboard EQ that I would recommend that's similar to the EQ that we have designed to put in our amp? And the answer is no. That's why I designed the EQ that we put in our amp, because there isn't anything out there that fills that bill. As Can I, you elaborate on that? As I That's said, actually interesting. On a previous show, the EQ is designed with the guitar, the physical behavior of the guitar in mind, the resonance of the body, the resonance of the neck, uh, the uh, the the resonance of the bridge the size of the headstock and different guitars and, you know, the scale length and all that. And whether or not there's a, uh, a touring circuit in the, the tone stack. In Absolutely. And, and, and so, um, and so the frequencies on our graphic are designed to, to zero in on those things and of course every guitar has slightly different resonances on the neck and the body and on the hardware and also 
uh, the frequency behavior of the pickups, of course. So, you know, what's actually electrically coming out of the guitar, going through the electronics. The EQ is designed to, the, the bands of the EQ are designed to, to aim at those behaviors and frequencies. And because each of those frequencies has not, not only has sort of a frequency range that they operate in, but but uh, some of them are kind of hard to pick up because they're little frequency ranges. Mm -hmm. So when there's an area on the guitar that we want to pick out something and accentuate it or cut it down a little bit, we make the that band on the EQ have a wider Q, have more bandwidth in there to pick up and bring out or suppress those things a little easier, a little more easy, a little uh -huh. easily, easy, a little easier. Sorry, um, e caffeine easier. obviously isn't good job yet. Uh, whereas Three the low levels. frequencies, the low frequencies are easier to capture. So the low frequency Q is narrower. Uh, and so and peakier because we don't want to just mud up the whole thing we just want that little area so the higher frequencies on our graphic have a wider cue and the lower frequencies have a narrower cue and that's really unusual in a graphic cue you wouldn't really design a normal graphic well, cue that way but but let me ask you this you being a veteran of the the Mesa Mark wars <laughs> what how similar is your EQ to what Randy did? They're light years different. Interesting. Okay. They're light years different. The content and, that I And the thing is, is the whole gain structure of the Mesa amps was geared towards, Randy's whole thing was sustain and gain. Mm -hmm. Sustain mm -hmm. and gain. Sustain and gain. Sustain and gain. More so gain, like blow the sustain. mids up beyond everything that you possibly ever because that's where all the gain it. is yeah 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 you don't want you don't want tons and tons of 10k mm -hmm. you don't want tons and tons of 100 hertz mm -hmm. but you sure want between 1k and and 3k all day long you mm -hmm. know 500 for the singy sustainy thing yeah yeah the violin yeah thing um again in a specific context a little combo sometimes a hardwood combo with a high performance speaker because in a little amp with a big power amp a single 12 has to be able to handle power so it would have been the jbl and then the altec and then the, the ev and then yeah. the gauss you know mm -hmm. um so um you know the whole thing was just getting what you know, what basically Carlos Santana was after, more sustain. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there was another aspect of the design in the early days of the Mesas that involved getting more gain and mid-range out of them, which was called, uh, which in the form of a replace, a solid state replacement for the tube called a Fetron. Okay. And um, when the phone companies started trying to reduce energy and save maintenance costs, on telephone equipment that had 12 AX sevens in them, industrial 12 AX sevens. So 5880, not 5881, but um, 6201s and different variations of industrial variations of a 12 AX seven. They Teledyne came up with this device that was two FETs and a little metal can with the same pin out as a 12 AX seven that you could plug in there. Okay. And it, op it operated like a little triode. This is the Fetron. Called it, and there was so, and there was two in each can, so it was exactly a footprint of a twelve X seven, except it didn't have a heater in it. So you plug that in, Such and a dorky name, Fetron. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, and he and Randy like picked up on these, and um, he bought a bunch of them, and he put them in the amp, and they had to like do a special treatment on them to keep them from blowing up. But they were very mid rangey telephones, mid range frequency response, so you could hear the person talking yeah. on the phone. So they did, they accentuated the mid range by using those even more. Mm -hmm. So um, then the graphic becomes the tool, which was it eventually, it eventually occurred to somebody to go, I don't need all that damn mid range. 
but the amp had it inherently like without that eq you kind of like you're stuck with it so the eq is there to kind of ameliorate what was had been done earlier in the amplifier right right and and, and then add, and then add right. some top end and some bottom end because a single 12 combo can be real boxy sounding right right but, you know, then somebody took that, took a head version of that amp, plugged it into a 412 cabinet, scooped out the mids, jacked up the bottom and top, and like, oh, okay, now it's starting to sound like something I can use, right? So really, that's the 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 EQ in the Mesa is it's it makes perfect sense that you would scoop it out, v scoop it out with their EQ. It's designed to do that. 750 hertz, right in the middle. <laughs> Get all that. They'd already set up the preamp stages. To have all the mid-range, d- mid-range derived gain that they could get out of it, and the EQ okay. was after all that. Right. So after jacking up all the gain to get all the sustain distortion, then you then, had to turn it into something. <laughs> then you had to turn it into something. So that's what that was about. Our EQ is much more surgical in its application and much more sophisticated. So yeah, is it in the same uh, spot? No. I didn't think so, but no, they're I entirely different. Out. Okay, all right. They're they're entirely different frequencies. Um, interestingly enough, the frequencies that are written on the Mesa amp are not the frequencies that those sliders are actually operating at. <laughs> so. Just like the whole wattage thing. Wait, did I just say that? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> hey man, I've owned many Mesa amps. I'm not talking smack really. I've had so much fun I've, with Mesa amps. I've played through. I've played through many of them. I played through lots of Mark ones. Mark I still have a Mark IV. Mark I still have, have your Mark IV. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I Next already question. had my. I already had my Sonic stew in my head way before I ever accounted a Mesa. So when that came across, I was like, "Yeah, I can see," you know. On my clients, I can see why my clients dig this and use it, and are, it's a new thing for them, mm-hmm. you know. And it serves a purpose; it has sure. a place; it has a reason to exist. It sounds in the right hands; they sound absolutely phenomenal, no doubt about it. Was wasn't my particular thing, so I, I, I had one for a short period of time, and 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 then I didn't. Um, but again, I already had a, I already had a thing in my head, and it wasn't going anywhere. It, it wasn't going anywhere. You had a head full of bees. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's so, do the next question, or we'll be okay. On there's here one more. Years. There's one more on the Facebook page from Corey Johnson. I would love an explanation of the difference between this synergy sag control versus how the GPDI dynamics control works. Hmm. I, very That's much good. prefer the GPDI implementation and wish the synergy behaved in a similar way. If a mod is available, I'd be interested. Okay. Um, damn it. Where did that go? Did I just hear this? Corey. Oh, great question. Yeah. And um, you're absolutely right. And I was sure that somebody would pick up on that by now. And it's taken a lot longer than I expected. So kudos to you for having the attention span to get that deep into it. And we're talking nerdy stuff here now, but um, yeah, the um, it's, it has to do with how the dynamics circuit in both of those products is triggered in the GPDI. It's the, the the circuit that actually causes the sag to happen is triggered by the audio signal coming in from your guitar. Um, in the GPDI, it's there's a buffer right after the input stage that converts that your guitar signal into a trigger voltage that triggers the sag control and the sag knob determines how much of that trigger Wait, i think you you flip those you're talking about the synergy module right I'm now talking about the gpdi right now but in this but, but that's not a sag control well it's called I'm dynamics just, in yeah the, I, i'm just needing to clarify the term so we don't confuse people sorry yeah the uh um because what's it called on the synergy yeah. unit 
Because I think it's, it's just called stable SAG dynamics. The, it's called SAG on the Synergy product. It's the same circuit, but it's called Dynamics on, on the GPDI. The right. GPDI. Uh, on the GPDI, uh, it's the trigger signal is just like one stage down through a buffer off of the input jack. And in the SIN1 and SIN2, it's after the module output. And the reason for that is because each module behaves a little differently. So um, the GPDI is a fixed, it's a closed system, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there isn't it's gonna an be- an entire amplifier. <laughs> it's an entire amplifier. And then there isn't gonna be an alien uh, presence that you unplug and plug in to change the whole personality and vibe of it. So it doesn't really need to, to be um, to have different a different trigger point uh, for under different circumstances. You just set it. You're a X kind of player. You're playing X kind of a guitar. You set the knob to where it has the right sensitivity that matches your pick attack, and away you, you set up the sound of the GPDI, and away you go. In the synergy, it's really kind of keyed off of which module you using, how you set it, and where the volume controls are set on the um on the on the modules so it's a little touchier and it's actually in hindsight it probably should have been triggered from the input stage instead because it's you still trigger it off the kind of guitar that you use and um the way you uh, and your pick attack right uh -huh. Uh -huh. so at the end of the day, it probably would have worked better in the synergy if we had done it um, ahead of the modules instead of after it. So there's kind of like a there's a there's a, 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 a an upside and a downside to doing it either way. So that makes sense. Um, uh, then the question is, can the sin one or sin two be modified to um, change the trigger point to run the side control so that it operates more like GPTI? And the answer is yes, it actually can be done. And it makes it a little bit more touch sensitive and it makes it easier to dial in. So I've experimented with the, the one that I have here. I did that in that um, as an experiment. And I decided that it, it for my personal purposes, it works better for me. Um, so you kept it that way? <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, uh, I did, but the, uh, the synergy guys, they're not all that convinced that it even needs to be on there. I thought I remembered you talking about that. That's yeah, kind of a point of contention. To be that people don't use it right anyway. So it's almost like, um, why even bother? And I totally can understand that we've been using this circuit since the GP three preamp, which came out mm -hmm. in 1998. OK, mm -hmm. so we've been through all of that. Uh, why is my GP3 sound so mushy? Where do you have the dynamics knob set all the way up? Why? Because I like that mushy. I like that spongy sound. OK, you set it to be spongy. There's your mush. So so, uh, so now you're coming. <laughs> Maybe that's what you need to call it. Why? Why is why is my GPDI, why is my GP3 sound so spongy? Because you said it's spongy. You said it's the spongiest setting that you could possibly set for it. Back it yeah. off. Well, I like to have it on. Okay, if you like to have it on, then you like the spongy sound. Yeah, but I don't want the spongy sound. Turn the knob down. But then it doesn't, you know, you get into these sort of circular conversations with people where they're not really getting or listening to what you're saying, <laughs> and it becomes fruitless. Okay, you're just going to have yeah, to Yeah, well, yeah. You're yeah. going to have to be eventually get to be a more skilled player to where you can zero in on the subtleties of a feature rather than just, I don't like it at zero and I don't like it at a hundred. So put well, it somewhere in between. Yeah. Well, where exactly? Well, go do some homework, go practice, go play, experiment with all the different guitars and you'll see. And that's that obvious. What, obviously what Corey did. Yeah. Hence the and question. That, that, that's what Corey did. Yeah. And he went, oh, you know what? When I do it on that, it does 
it reacts the way I would expect something like to react. That's and that right. one, it doesn't. Now, you only know that it doesn't because you've heard the other expression of it in the other product where it is more optimized because it's a simpler <laughs> sort of a straight ahead path, straight ahead path from beginning to end. You're like, so, now that's how a touring circuit's supposed to work. I'm going to choke you if I hear that for I'm never going to stop. It's my, it's my favorite thing. All right. Then I'm going to start. I'm going to start start in on the black. And uh oh, that's, we're in that's trouble. What, if that's what it's going to be about. But as you do that, let's start in on another question. Uh, that takes going. care of the the Facebook one. So thanks you guys for those questions. They're good ones. And uh, you pick asking for a friend. Where do you get your ideas? <laughs> Isn't that the same kind of question as what the hell kind of idea was that? <laughs> or the simplified version, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> that's that's a good question. It's valid. Um, if I, I'm looking now at uh, some of these questions that are have been happening in the chat of this broadcast. And Joe, you're going to you're going to moderate. And Great. I'm Okay. Follow your lead. So uh, this is from uh, BJG1804. I'm not going to try and say that fast. Um, he's saying that he really digs this channel. And uh, he purchased a brand new EL34 version of the 50 ST head. And not long after bought a Pitbull 45 and a Super 30, and Super 30 combo. Uh, and he uses those amps and he would love to hear, uh, how these particular amps came to be and what Steve's original intention was when originally designing these models, man, I'll say right now that, uh, which episode did we do it when you had the prototype, uh, up? what was that called? Cause we talked about that quite a bit. Um, well, actually that was, he's talking about a different, a later range of the littler amps. Oh, um, okay. Then this is totally, uh. This is new. This you is tee new off on this. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the first little combo we made was the Pitbull uh, 5012, it, 50 watts, four EL84s. And uh, <clears throat> that is that the more, first time you did anything with 84s? Yeah. And the first time we made something little, portable. Uh, and it did really well. And then um, we had guys coming around, uh, you know, session guys and touring guys and, and people that are playing the local clubs and, and um, real good players, guys that are playing in five or six bands and, and doing sessions and stuff like that. And um, actually a lot of guys using deluxes that wanted something hipper, you know, mm -hmm. wanted something a little bit more flexible and sort of saw the, the 50 s the 5012 as potentially that but not that mm -hmm. it needs more of this it needs more of that so we had a couple of players come along and and sort of express what they would like how they would like the amp uh, optimized for their playing style and their what they were hoping to hear and some of the things it's almost there it just needs ugh. and um so that became the Pitbull 45, which the, uh, the 5012 had a solid state rectifier. So the 45 got a tube rectifier, so it would be more bouncy. And then we uh, massaged the frequency response a little bit so that it was uh, more forgiving and smoother on the top and rounder on the bottom. It originally had a 100 watt speaker and i noticed somebody mentioned something about are we going to bring back the p100 and no we're not uh it was too stiff of a speaker uh it got replaced with the p75 which is a really nice speaker and um uh that eventually went into the pitbull 45 it was a little woodier sounding speaker and not quite so deep and bright so everything that made the pitbull 5012 
I mean, the Pitbull 5012 was really just a small version of the big amps. It didn't have as much gain, but it had that sort of attack and the punch on the bottom, which is what we were looking for. Oh, most of the guys that were using little combos like that were wanting things a little more versatile and rounder and smoother so that he could go into several different sessions and just tweak the amp a little bit and it would be right. But I would have thought the 84s kind of provided a little bit of that. Well, that's the whole thing about tubes. It goes mm -hmm. back to the whole just the, the whole thing about well, I think the, I thought the power tubes sounded like that. Right. This. Yeah. That's so interesting. They, they do if you design the amp to make the tubes do that. Mm -hmm. So and when what, what I wanted to put just like the 34 6L6 thing. They, but they so could, when when you went uh, when, when you brought out the 45 and you were talking about massaging it to, to make it a little more forgiving in this, um, are you saying that the 5012 was less forgiving? Yeah, it was much more aggressive and tighter and brighter. Oh, that's deeper. so interesting. That's cool. Puck rock bands loved that amp. Really? Because it was small and affordable and easy to lug around at, at, at all these... Little See, club I love club, the it had this sort of ferocious sort of rah, had a lot of claw, uh, but the, the the session guys and the and the you know the the multiple gig, you know five gigs, eight gigs a week, you know kind of road dogs. They wanted something that did a lot of different things. You know, so yeah. we 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 did that. We we made it we made it a little bit more malleable, okay. and. Um, uh, it was going to be called the Model T because it had a tube rectifier in it. <laughs> that would have been cool. <laughs> and um, we took it. We took it to. Uh, there was a big shootout. There was a big uh, combo shootout in Guitar Player Magazine around the time that amp came out. And um, it all. We all convened up in San Francisco at. Um, Wait, at who's all? Like who? All the all the amp manufacturers that had a, a combo. You didn't just send them in the guitar player and have them. We went to, everybody was invited to go to the SIR in San Francisco was hosted by guitar player magazine. So Whoa. all the companies were invited to go there. That's stand when up in front of your in peers with your amp and present it to all of your competitors, what? explain it to them and then demonstrate it for them to show you how you are different than all of those oh, guys. Oh man. When was, where was you? When this was going on, that would have been so cool. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And we actually, you know, I mean, it sort of cemented the fact that we're all in this game. You know, there's room for everybody. And yeah, and it was like kind of it was kind of like a G7 conference. You know what I mean? It was just like everybody was on really good behavior and listened and and uh, commented politely and asked intelligent questions. And it was a lot of fun. And then. Guitar Player Magazine did an article about it, and they in the in the form of kind of like a shootout review. And 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 um, uh, Bruce Inky was working at Fender at the time, and they were just coming out with the Pro Sonic. So um, Bruce played through it, and he goes, "Man, I really like this amp. It really sounds nice, and the reverb is way better than the fifty twelve was. And you did a great job on that. Just, I just want to give you a little heads up. Fender has just acquired the Sun trademark, and they had an amp called the Model T. They were going to re-release, so you probably don't want to use Model T for the name. And I went, thanks for the tip. I appreciate that. I thought that was long gone. So... Um, uh, we changed it to the Pitbull 45 right on the spot. I went to Art Thompson at Guitar Player Magazine and I said, make sure that you change the name of this amp to the P Pitbull 45 in the copy. We just like that. Oh, 10 minutes after smart. he told me that, I went to Art Thompson and I gave him the new name. I had one other person from the company with me and we kind of hobnobbed a little bit. And, what are we going to call this? What should we call it? Well, it's 45 West. Just fuck it. Pitbull 45. Okay. That was turning hey, Art, on a dime. Yeah, Art, that was pivot. Scratch that. Put in that, and <laughs> and that was it. So that was wow. a, that was a blast. So kind of so thank that, you. It Bruce. went from the S. It went from the fifty twelve, uh, and then the fifty twelve also had a head version of it called the ST, small top, and um, and then the forty five one twelve combo came out, and then the forty five head came out with it, and then uh. 
and then the 5012 i wanted the 5012 to to grow its own sort of um evolution i wanted that i wanted that one to get an evolution that would make it more useful because it was it, the 45 kind of obsoleted the the 5012 in terms of el84s there was really kind of no point for the 5012 to exist like that anymore because the 45 was a, just a better expression of it all the way around so what we did was we went back to the 5012 and the 50 st head and changed them from el84s to el34s for el84 okay. to el34s added some features did some refinements and just basically made it a little beefier and uh that's where the the wide body 5012 and uh the fit the el3450 st head came from well, what about what what's the super 30 the super 30 uh was the uh class a only that was meant to be a little bit more of a affordable combo with with less features that a lot of people didn't understand so we basically stripped down the feature set and made a more affordable amp out of it called the Super 30, which okay, was just cool. a 30. The 45 had a Class A and Class A B switch. So Super 30 was Class A only. Mm. And uh, a little less power, again, a little bit uh, more forgiving sound, but without the tube rectifier, we designed a little sag into the power transformer so that we didn't have to rely on a tube rectifier to accomplish that. And that reduced manufacturing costs and made it more reliable. So uh -huh. that's that's where the Super 30 came from. Cool. Well, our buddy BJG1804, uh, still rocking all those. So, um, oh, no, you're going to hate this next question from our buddy Brendan. He wants to know when the PS100s will be back in stock again. They are back in stock again. Pow! So you were happy. And where are you anyway? I'm up at the top of the show. We're working our way down. No, where is... Oh, where's Brendan? Yeah. Uh, calling all Brendans. Brendan yeah, Lucero. Where, where are you in. located? I got your next PC. This amp was envisioned, designed, and conceptualized whilst on a bender at Cape Cod. Well, close. Tijuana would probably be a better location. All right. You ready for another one? You sure am. Okay, uh, I guess this is for, for both of us, it looks like. Uh, what are your favorite amps, if you could pick one or two? What's your favorite amp, Steve? It's like asking me who's my favorite guitar player. Yeah, but you got to pick one this time. What's your favorite one today? Favorite amp of any brand or favorite yeah, amp? Yeah, any brand. Make? Let's, okay, two part. What's your favorite amp that you have created? And then if there's a difference, what? Okay, no, let's just do your favorite non Fryat amplifier and then your favorite of yours. Um, I, I, I haven't really strayed far from from uh what lit my fire originally and i still think that uh, the like the 68 to 70 era dr103 is the shit that's I mean, where it all kind of goes it, back to it's such a one trick pony it's such a specific thing half of uh half of what I like about it is it's not for everybody and it's especially not for you. You know, I mean, it's yeah, like the yeah. guys, it's just, it's a malcontent. I, yeah. I dig the fact that there's people that hate it and that it won't work for them. That's mm -hmm. kind of why I like it. it Cause it, it didn't really work for you when you started with it. Right. Well, the 50 did. And probably oh. I should go oh, back and good. say, yeah, the 50 was the 50 is actually, closer to my heart than the 100 although i do like the 100 i like that big roaring spank of the 100 it's but a little scary i was going to go out and play if i if i didn't have what i have here and needed to go out and play a gig uh and maybe somebody else had produced the power station and i had one uh i would take the i would take a dr504 and a power station and be the happiest puppy on the planet okay all right 
Now, um, your amplifier. Now I have to. Now I have to say that the thing about the high watt that was uh, always a little bit of an, a stumbling block for me that I, that actually caused me to start experimenting with amps and eventually produce our own. Uh, if that DR five hundred four had been what the Master Lead fifty Sound City amp is now. It, that the the high watt would not have it, it it wouldn't have survived the competition the the the, the master lead the sound city master lead 50 that we make is what i always wished the dr504 would do and sound like close to it but that last little step of being able to manipulate it with the guitar and make it less of a one trick pony make it a broader a broader more colorful useful palette yeah yeah so um as far as as far as an amp that doesn't have a big feature set that i would gravitate to right after that i would say the set the master lead 50 is is like at some point in my life that would have been my grail that would have been the amp that i if i bought that 30 years ago, I would still have it today. Okay. Um, right. Of the amps of the amps that we produce right now that really do it for me, it's the D60 Series 2. It's just no contest. Oh, that's very cool because... I now... really actually prefer the 120, but I know that I can't, uh, I can't get it to quite do what the D60 will do for me, which is just get that little... Uh, that th there's a character of the, of the output saturation that the 60 does. The 120 is just got the, it's with a stock strat. It's just the, you know, it just has this big wide face slapping spank thump. It's just a wide, wide palette. And I love that. Yeah. Uh, you always have to have a power station with it or you'll, you'll yeah. murder people, but it, I, I love that about it. The 60 is something that I could probably take out to a gig without the power station and do okay. Although with the power station, so much the better, but because the D60 series two has a loop in it, I wouldn't feel constrained by that, that gig that I did at, at, at uh, uh, the gig that I did at the Greek a few weeks ago, if I had had, if I had been able to bring my own amp to that gig, I would have brought a D60 half stack and maybe the power station, but I wouldn't have needed it because the D60 has got the loop. I would have been happy as pig and shit for that. Uh, man, that's, that's very interesting to me. Um, my favorite amps real quickly. Um, I kind of hate to answer this because I'm going to sound like a shill too. Uh, so I'll, I'll do it uh, this, the same way. I'll, I'll talk about Fryat stuff and then I'll talk about non Fryat stuff. So my favorite amp in the world, um, hands down, is the Ether. And uh, it has been since I first played the thing. I mean, there's nothing else out there remotely like that amplifier. And uh, like... It's kind of embarrassing to say it being on this show and having you right here because it sounds like I'm making it up. But what? that's the best small sorry, amp in the history of the world to me. Uh, and then, but a, a totally different animal. Um, the bigger stuff. I am now in love with the the D60 series too, and a big part of that is because I've been working uh, pretty much exclusively. Uh, with the GPDI for my workload for the past five damn years. Yeah, five and, years. And uh, the deliverance, you know, get, finally getting to have one, you know, I've been spending uh, the last couple of weeks with it. Um, it feels like the large amp manifestation of that kind of spirit, which kind of makes sense because there's a deliverance sort of mode and character to the GPDI. It's not the same. I mean, when I, when I play uh, the... The deliverance it's like whoa it's i mean it is what it is it's it's a full amplifier <laughs> delivers more than one watt <laughs> but i'm a massive fan of that amplifier now so 
uh, again, well, that, that, that video the demo that you did of it was just, it was masterful. I, everything oh, about you. that video was, was thank you. Amazing. I'm just uh, barely uh, learning how to use that amplifier. I could I tell because that. I'm looking at the knob. I'm looking at the control <laughs> settings. I'm going, <laughs> What's that? By the way, guys, Steve teased the hell out of me when he watched I that did. video and he looked at the settings. He's like, what the hell are you doing? He said, it sounds great, but what in the hell are you thinking? See, that's the <laughs> beauty of it. Out. That's the beauty of it is like you did exactly the polar opposite of any way that I would set it. And yet when I listened to it, I was like going, that's that's one of the best uh <laughs> demonstrations of the capability of the deliverance that i've ever heard and and probably oh, will man. hear and oh, I'm but glad to hear. but the <laughs> you did what and, and i mean that's almost like icing on the cake for me is somebody just like went <laughs> and i'm like i gotta go try that now <laughs> Well, I, I love those amps. And then real quickly, uh, outside of Fry at Land, um, forever my favorite amps were uh, old Super Reverbs and old Deluxe Reverbs. That's kind of where it kind of starts for me, which is kind of weird. You know, we talk about high gain or higher gain stuff here. Um, I have I respect the Marshall thing. I, I respect the big amp thing. But I didn't, you know, the kind of work that I got involved in early on and kept doing, that wasn't really the the main tools uh, that I was able to use. So, um, like, I, I have a 65 Deluxe Reverb and I have a 68 Super Reverb. I've had them forever, and I I love them. I love them. Not re using them much anymore, you know, because I'm – I. I adore the ether so much. And now if I want, you know, the bigger thing, um, I'm, I, I have to get a deliverance myself. I'm real excited to finally get to try the 120 and see what that's like right now. I can't, it's just a curiosity. I don't know what the hell else I'd want other than the, the D60. Cause it's so, um, I mean, <laughs> it's really a good me, amp for that, you because it, it's because of the way you play. And uh, the things that you use it for, it's 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 perfect for you. And by the way, guys, uh, I did. Jo Joe's not done doing videos for the D60 or the no. D120. That was just one of th three or four that we have planned. Yeah. And so after that first one, I went to I'm him excited. and I said, "Okay, the next one, I want you to set it more like this." Well, so and 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 and. We're really going to, well, I'm, I'm going to do one that focuses more on kind of the clean aspect of that amplifier because that does that beautifully. As we talked about on a previous episode, you know, there's more of that, uh, the, the Sound City, big, massive, mm -hmm. clean kind of DNA running through those amps. But mm -hmm. so I want to illustrate that side of it more and also uh, also like getting the higher gain stuff happening with just the master volume and not even using the power station next yeah. time. So you got all that going. So anyway, that's our favorite amps. Uh, let's see more. Oh, really can I just say one thing about the, yeah. about the, about the ether, mm -hmm. um, why it's not my pick as my favorite. It's not because I don't love it. It's just, um, the, and I have gone out and gigged with the ether. Oh, you have, I didn't know that one time. And I took it out with a Sound City 412 cab and a power station. Of course you would. So I had the the Ether amp with its own internal speaker and then the extension cab, the extension speaker out of the power module, the 16 ohm speaker out of that. I ran that into the power station set to 16 ohms and then powered the Sound City cab with that and put reverb in that. Oh, wow. And the reason I did that is so that I could pound the ether, but get this big expansive sound out of the 412. And I had the tremolo on all the time. Uh, so you're pounding the amp. So would yeah. you like hit it and the tremolo would disappear? And then as you kind of let things sustain, it would kind of come back in. And that I did that because that what I told people was if you set the tremolo right and then gas the amp, you can use the guitar volume to control when where the tremolo comes in yeah. or not even. And right. I, I want, well, I don't want to be talking out of my ass. I want to be able to 
to definitively state that and have it be true. And the only way I would know that for sure is to go out and do it. So I did. And we played a song that had no need for any tremolo. And I just backed the guitar volume down two notches so it was still in crunch territory and it was still swamping out the tremolo. So I played the whole song without anybody hearing any tremolo coming but out. it was of the on. <laughs> the tremolo wouldn't really happen until you turn the guitar volume down to five. Wow. And, and the the way the how responsive the ether is to the top end of the guitar, even with the volume down low, is good enough that it sounded really sweet and throbbing with the tremolo. But then open it up and it's gone, and you could solo, you know. And and then somebody would go, uh, "Yeah, what tremolo are you using? It's 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 built into the amp." But you were switching it on and off. No, it wasn't. It was on the whole night. Uh, awesome. I, I just love doing stuff like that. Yeah, because you know, it makes people go. I don't get it. Help me, you know. And then I explain it to them, and they go, "That never occurred to me." I go, "Yeah, I know. That's why I did it so that you could discover a new thing." And uh, so I love that about that is I get to go whoosh, to people, which is kind of like my trademark, I guess. Oh, well, again, that's that's malcontenty. Totally. Mm -hmm. um guys there's some you, you leaving some really kind comments thank you very much um we're gonna look for another question uh this one is also from mc80 and uh let's see i have a ps i'm assuming a ps1 and a ps100 could both handle my major dr201 d120 I would never claim warranty if there was an issue, but your shit is clearly overbuilt. <laughs> I think I know what he's getting at. Um, where Where is that? This is way up higher, I think. You'd need to back up. I don't know if you still can. I've just kept my chat parked oh. up high, so I didn't lose uh, those comments. What's the time? What time is it? Uh, 6.54. Okay. There it is. Yeah, I can see it. Six fifty four. Uh, the PS, a PS and PS. You mean a PS two and a PS one hundred? Both probably a I PS two or a PS one even. Yeah, both could handle my major T D R. I would never claim warranty if there was an issue. But your shit is clear. All right, one comment question about the about the PS two or the PS one hundred being able to run a, a Marshall major or a D120 into it. Yeah, you can. Um, it's just not the kind of thing that you really want to dime. It'll handle it all day long. The fan will take care of it. It'll get hot. Yeah. Um, and you don't want to do it for hours and hours. You don't want to really slam. I don't know why you would want to slam a Marshall major because if you push a Marshall major, the way they're designed, uh, if you push them into power amp distortion, they start drawing all kinds of grid current and that's what causes them to blow up. Oh. So if you're pushing the power amp stage in a Marshall major really hard, you'll fry it. No pun intended. Uh, and uh, you, you, may, uh, you may buy, uh, you may take out an output transformer, probably not likely, you'll mostly just arc, you'll blow the tubes and arc the tube sockets. And uh, it's it, it won't be pretty, um, but for a limited amount of time, the power either power station will handle it. It'll just get bloody hot, and that's all right. Um, and really, neither unit sweated though. I was a bit more careful with the original PS. Typical Fryette bullshit. Claim one thing, but it ends up better than advertised. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you, you got to ask him if he can use that in your marketing. Uh, yeah, material. really. That's a good one. <laughs> and, and Brendan, um, the reason that it, it, the reason I say it's in stock, but it isn't showing as in stock on our web store, which I didn't understand that that's what you were aiming at when you were ask, asking your question. We sell to dealers. So we have a relationship with our dealers and we sell our product to our dealers and we're not in competition with our dealers. We only have stuff to sell on our web store for 
ostensibly for customers who are in areas where we don't have a dealer or where they don't have easy access to our products, like in Canada, like some parts of Europe, like elsewhere in the world, uh, where it's difficult to get the right voltage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when something says it's out of stock on our web store, it doesn't mean we're out of stock of the product. It doesn't mean the dealers don't have it. It just means that we're giving our dealers priority to get their orders filled first before we put it on our website for sale so that we don't appear to be competing with our dealers. They don't really like that. And we don't want them to feel that way because they're stocking our product and doing the promotion for the product is what helps you guys find and be able to buy our product in all kinds of different places where we may not necessarily sell. And their marketing is they throw more money at their marketing. So they're more visible than we are. And so more people can get them from dealers than they would even know to find them from us. So the only time, uh, something shown out of stock on our web store is when we've our when we've got dealer orders to fulfill first it just so happens in the last two years that we've got nothing but dealer orders to fulfill first we're like three to four months back order continuously and have been for the last year and a half on power stations four months so pretty much you're always going to see uh, that it's out of stock on our web store. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist or dealers don't have it. It just means we don't have any extra than the factory to sell around the dealers. As long as the dealers have stock, that's the place to go. Okay, cool. Um, hey, again, I just want to acknowledge um, all you guys saying really nice things about uh, the demo video stuff and my playing and whatever I, I appreciate that guys um now another question uh steve speaking of speakers what is the so uh, oh this is from wayne denton by the way uh what's the sonic difference between the deliverance 412 and the fat bottom with fanes that's question number one okay uh the current deliverance 412 the speakers are rear mounted the old Deliverance 412, the speakers were front mounted like the uh, fat bottom. But um, I felt like the Deliverance cab wanted to be rear mounted. And I'd been thinking about doing that to that cab for a long time. And I finally, when we released the D60, I thought, you know, this would be the perfect time. So is switch the deliverance cab to rear mounted from front mounted. Is that the same with the deliverance 212 as well? Well, the deliverance 212 that we have now bears no resemblance to the previous deliverance 212, which was a little taller and not as deep and had the two part vinyl and fabric grill on the front. Uh, it was more of a vintagey looking thing. It was expensive. It was big uh expensive to build big it wasn't it sounded good but it didn't sound like it was related to the 412 it was a completely ah. different animal uh -huh. and and it and i think that the the reception that we got for that reflected the fact that people didn't understand that different animalness of that version so when we came out with the D60 Series 2 models, the the 412 cab got the speakers rear-mounted and the 212 got a complete makeover to make it more like a smaller version of the big 412 cab. And that cab sounds phenomenal. It does. That's that what cab. I have. That's that's what I'm playing. The, it the really game. sounds like just a smaller version of a killer 412 cab. Yeah. So um, that's the deal with that. Okay. Uh, the, fat, the fat bottom, uh, the fat bottom, the speakers being front mounted, the baffle being tipped, and the the stiffer construction makes it more focused and tighter on the bottom, and a more aggressive in the upper mids. Um, okay, and there is uh, an uh, an additional question from Wayne: uh, Is there an ETA, or is everything still in maximum flux capacity? Is he? I, I'm assuming he's talking about cabs. Could that be right? Uh, what, what's the, what question are you looking at? Uh, this is Wayne Denton at 7.22 p.m. And uh, he was 
he asked the questions about the the difference in the cabs, but then there was a second question about the ETA. So I'm assuming. Oh, the ETA and the cabs. Yeah. yeah. Um, speakers uh, are going on the boat this coming week to get here. Finally, they're finally going on the boat uh, to get here. They're we're in the end of September. They were supposed to ship at the end of July. That's how late they are. That's how late Fane is. Supposed to ship at the end of July. Then they said the end of August. And they actually sent us all the information that we needed to transmit to our shipper to pick them up this last Wednesday. Wow. So... uh but then it then it gets to it gets shipped here and then it gets to sit in LA Harbor for how long before you get them? It's different it's, because it's coming from the UK. Uh, I don't even want to think about that. I think it okay. comes it comes in it comes in on the Atlantic coast and then it goes cross country by rail or something. It's there's no easy answer. So the answer that. is we get there when we get there. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. We don't really know what the logistics are going to be like until the boat actually gets across the ocean. Okay. And then and then we'll find out what to I hope that it goes overland by rail or by truck once it gets to the east coast because then we have a hope of that it's in transit and there won't be like a bunch of boats sitting out in the LA harbor waiting for 3 or 4 weeks. Right. It's right. getting so bad now that that a ship that has to sit in the harbor down in LA harbor down in San Pedro for a couple of weeks now there's a because the ship has to anchor out in the bay for that period of time there is now a um delayed landing surcharge that they're charging on top of <laughs> so in other words they're saying you know the fact that we have to sit out here in the water for two weeks waiting for a berth we're charging you for that because okay. normally we would just come into the port, unload our stuff, and then leave. But since we have to sit there for two weeks, you're going to pay for us to sit out there and play poker and drink tequila on the... On wow. The wow. Yeah. So we got, right. we got our first... First of all, the shipping rates have increased tenfold. A 40-foot container a year ago cost $2,500 to, to, sh to ship. Okay. Now it's twenty thousand dollars. Oh, and there's a fuel surcharge, and uh, we're sitting out on the ocean, drinking scotch and smoking cigars and playing poker, and you're going to pay us to do that for a couple of weeks. Oh, wow, it's insane. Yeah, that's insane. I'm going to ask you another question. MC80 okay. asks, Steve. What amp designers do you really respect other than the aforementioned Peter Diesel? Oh, geez. Leo Fender. That's a cool question, he's not, actually. He's not really an amp designer. He was a tinkerer. There was other amp designers that 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 he worked with um, uh, that actually did the design work, and then he would tinker them. But it's the the... He's the guy that had the vision, right? He knew what to tinker with and what to tell the engineering guy. I needed to do this. I needed to do this. I needed to do that. And um, so uh, Randall Smith, uh, you know, uh, trying crazy shit and doing things outside of the box until he made it work. Um, and uh, um, of course, being in on the ground floor of jam packing all kinds of crazy performance into a little tiny box and setting the world on fire with it, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so, him certainly. Uh, um, Reinhold's Wagner is a freak of nature. I love him. Um, what he does is. It's it's more of a freewheeling sort of style of throwing stuff out there. To it's see. but it isn't it how your personality comes through your work? I mean, that's totally his personality too. Yeah, you know? yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, um, I'm probably, uh, well, you know, I mean, David Reeves, a um, huge mentor, a guy that really knew what he was doing electronically mm -hmm. and had a sonic vision and uh, had a real nobody's going to tell me what to do with my design streak. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm thinking. I know why I'm thinking it. I know why I'm executing this way. And if you don't like it, there's a lot of other places you can go see around. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, that's how you, that's how you keep from getting derailed by the marketplace of bad ideas and, you know, designs by committee and things that take or what would normally be a good idea and turn it into mush or like if you're going to have an idea that turns up being bad like really have it be your bad idea and own it rather own, than own the hell out of it like i did this thing and i knew i shouldn't have done. i watered down my original idea because i was listening too much to the peanut gallery mm. that's like that sucks you know so i mean failure on your own uh really failing on your own is worth something you know failing because you kind of capitulated that's the one that really sucks yeah well but that, and, and that's how you really learn that's how you, that's where you really that's that's where the that's where the rubber meets the road that yeah. that you 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 got to take risks you mm -hmm. got to try insane things we've and talked about that a, a, a lot on the show yeah, you know, and you're like step people on a who, rake once in a while, you know. But we talk about people who, you know, put something out and we kind of joke about it and laugh about it like that was a silly idea. But then we we always come back around and go, yeah, but you know what? Somebody needed to do that. And they had the, the you know, the eggs to go ahead and do that. You mm -hmm. know, so mm -hmm. it's always kudos to the person who steps out and does that, even if it's yeah. a massive flop. So, yeah. Uh, BJ Hale asks, what's the difference in the Fryette cabs and the Sound City cab? designs um the specifically it's the difference between the deliverance 412 cab and the sound city 412 cab because they're similar and they're different um they both have a vertical baffle it's not tipped the, the, the fat bottom cab is a completely different animal than those two and that's um, good because th that's why it should have a different name because it's yeah, totally different. Yeah. And that cabinet came along a long time ago and there's no good reason to change it. it. You know, the people that love it, love it. The people that hate it, hate it. Mm -hmm. Great. There's and never the twain shall meet. Far <laughs> be it from me to go, oh, I want the people that hate the fat bottom to love it. Let's water it down so that the people that love the fat bottom will now hate it because it's watered down. So you're just right like there, what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but there are people that for whom the fat bottom is just not it that doesn't do it for them, you know, and the deliverance cab was designed for them. And then it got massaged recently to, to do even a better job of that. And the, the sound city cabinet was designed to accentuate the behavior and the sound qualities of the sound city amps. So the construction is similar. It uses the V-brace on the baffle, but the back is different and it's vented on the back. And uh, I think the back is a little thicker on the on the Sound City cab than on the Deliverance cab. Uh, and But probably just from a cursory outside view, the thing that's the, the thing that's distinctively different and most obvious between those two is the fact that the the um, uh sound city cab is vented on the back and the 212 is also vented and that is because uh the speakers have plenty of power handling capacity and venting the cabinet allows the speaker excursion to increase a seal cabinet acts as a shock absorber on the speakers so they they move less when when hit with power uh -huh. A vented like speakers and the same speakers in a vented cab will do this as opposed to a sealed cabinet where they'll do this. Mm. So you can actually throw more power at a speaker in a sealed cabinet before it blows. Whereas mm. in a vented cabinet, especially if, it, if the vent 
is accentuating the low end, it could potentially tear up the speaker more easily. But they're high powered speakers, this, you know, 70 watt speakers. So that's a 280 watt cabinet with a 100 watt amp. It's very unlikely that you would blow them. But the, the Sound City head has a little bit of a bigger fundamental low end quality than the Deliverance. So it needs the cabinet to be able to, to uh, you know, um, handle that and deliver it accurately. So that's what the Sound City cabinet is optimized to do to bring out the bigger low end fundamental of the Sound City amp. Okay. Oh, awesome. and I just got I just got this update. The boat from UK goes to Chicago, Illinois. Uh, um, uh, by what? boat, so it goes to the East Coast, and I guess that means that it goes, um, gets to Chicago by water from the M I S S I S S I P P I, however that works, and uh, and then it goes. Uh, and then from Chicago, it gets to LA by truck. So that gives us all a little hope. Yay. Uh, get to the gear. Uh, ask me, am I drinking out of a wine bottle? No, my friend. It's just an extra tall bottle of Guinness this evening. Extra stout. Um, uh, this is also from Get to the Gear. What was it about Fane speakers that inspired you to start using their speakers? And how many brands did you test? Uh, I'm well, I've played every speaker there is. Yeah. Um, the thing that I liked about Fane speakers was the same thing I liked about high watt amps. They weren't Marshalls and they weren't Celestians. Um, I'm not the best guitar player in the world, but when I get up on stage, I want to be, I want to stand out. I want to be, I want people to notice that there's something different going on than they're used to hearing. However ham-fisted my playing may be against a, a band with a superior guitarist, you know, what can I do? I can at least establish my own territory and own that territory. And uh, one, the first time I looked at the high watt, I was intrigued. And then the first time I played through it, I was convinced. And then the first time I played it through the first time I heard it with a high watt cab, as opposed to a straight Marshall cabinet, which I had at the time, I just went, what took me so long. And then, uh, the great thing about it is even if I could dial it in to make it sound similar to other stuff, which I could do from time to time when I wanted to, people saw it that it was different and heard it as different, even if it didn't necessarily always sound different to them. They would perceive it as sounding different because they, they saw it as different. And that meant that, oh, you're the guy that uses that different rig that not very many other people use. Why are you using that rig? For this very reason, so that you would notice it. And, um, and then I just sort of, I stuck to that. That was just kind of like my signature thing. I'm not going to use what everybody uses. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that meant that it was, in, in, it was incumbent upon Fane to continue making speakers, which they didn't do. Their speaker quality went up and down. They were, they were here. They were gone. They were sold to Wharfdale. They were, they were sold by Wharfdale. They were owned by another company that did a terrible job. And then they put out some <laughs> speakers for a couple of years, and then they stopped again and blah, 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 blah. And they've been through so many convolutions and changes, good and bad, that it was very, very frustrating to be a fane uh, uh, aficionado you know, for this long and just like yeah. hope for the brand to finally <laughs> land somewhere where somebody would just be the caretaker of the brand for a change. Uh -huh. I always wish that about Hiwat too. And that still hasn't happened. The people yeah. in Hiwat are trying, they're doing an incredible job. They're trying, but it's not the way I would have done it. And of course it's not the way I would have done it, but um, everybody has a different way of seeing things, but I would, I would do, I would have done it differently. And uh, the Sound City project gave me the opportunity to show what I would have done if High Watt had been under our auspices. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. necessarily from a marketing point of view, because 
we're not throwing a lot of marketing energy on the Sound City right at the moment. It's just a, it, it's just the, the it's nature. It's so under the radar right now. Well, the radar. There will be a time because yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. F the radar. We just had another record month that's closing up September that's going to close another record quarter for us, for, for the Fryette brand. And here, here. This has been raise your black and everybody. I, the, I've been even doubting the wisdom of doing the show every two weeks. I feel like we should do it every week because there's so many things to talk about, but it, it feels to me like it's been a month since we did the last show and the previous show, it felt the same way. It's because there's so much going on in that two week period that by the time we get back here, there's no way we could have found way, a way to squeeze in, an episode between the previous one and this one. There's just no way. This yeah. last two week period, so many things happened. We pounded out tons and tons of product. <laughs> uh, opportunities have come up. Things, exciting things have happened. I got my favorite guitars worked on finally. I went and saw um, uh, George Benson live for the first time. Oh my God, was that awesome? And um, Oh, I watched the um, the anybody any of you guys watch that um, the Muhammad Ali doc on PBS for Ken series. Burns? Yeah, the new Ken Burns. Phenomenal. Yeah, I got to see it. I mean, it's about boxing, but it's not about boxing. It's about the evolution of of the, the recognition of the African American experience in this country over the whole span of Muhammad Ali's career and how he so seamlessly perfectly uh, manifests how he how he um, um, just e encapsulates the whole experience from the mid 60s up until 2016 lighting the the Olympic flame while he's got Parkinson's it's just it's to die for and it should be watched and it should be appreciated for what it is. Uh, so I had that experience. And then after having watched all four episodes of that, then going and seeing, um, uh, George. Play George, his, Benson. George Benson play his first show in two years, first time on stage in two years and just, yeah, Burn he's a down. titan, though. He's a titan. Burned it down. Yeah. Burned it down. Yeah. He's like, it's not just his guitar playing. He's an entertainer. He's a showman. He's like on top of the game. He's got, he's got all these elder ladies boogalooing down the the aisle from their seats all the way to the front of the stage with their cameras to get a close up of them and blow him kisses and stuff. And then boogaloo all the way back up, back to their seats. And they're, they're like, there were these two women that sat in front of us that were, you know, in their late sixties, they were ready to throw down, man. And they're like laughing and giggling with each other, like 16 year olds. It was hilarious. They, he brought, he brought the goods and he brought the kid out in everybody in that audience. He was no slouch. He wasn't playing wishy-washy Vegas music for a bunch of burnouts. He was playing what he always does. He's bringing the goods to these people. And they're like, this is what we came here for. And it was awesome. It was really awesome. It sounded great. It looked great. It felt great. I was so glad that I saw it, that I was able to, to, to experience that and just watch him trip out. And, you know, I mean, Fender did a, a signature amp with him. It's some variation of the hot rod, Fender hot rod de Villa or whatever. And I, I remember thinking, really? I don't, man, they must have worked really closely with him to figure out that that was his next evolution and what he wanted in an amplifier because it didn't make any sense to me. And what is he using at the gig? Two twins, just like always. Mm. So, <laughs> and it sounded amazing, just like always. So there you go. He had a killer rhythm section, a phenomenal drummer. 
Oh my God, that was a show. So massive, massive, wonderful things happened, you know, interesting things and, and intellectually stimulating things happening over the last couple of weeks. It was great, 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 great. Busy, 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 busy. And in all of that, just, just banging out product. And uh, it was it's just like hectic, crazy. We, why did I even bring any of all of that up? It was just, <laughs> you know, uh, one thing that I, I I always think of with George Benson is, you know, I I used to listen to his kind of pre singer records, you know, his jazz records, and um, you know, when he was kind of like a, you know. Like, a, I really love Wes Montgomery, incredibly kind of guitar player. Mm -hmm. But then I remember this interview, you know, when he had the the breakthrough with what was Breezin, like the first thing that kind of sent him over the edge. And uh, he was talking about the, um, he was being asked about, you know, the, the idea of selling out, you know. Oh, you're a jazz musician, highly respected musician, you know, winning all the guitar polls. And what do you say to people who, you know, consider you a sellout now that you're on the pop charts? And I'm paraphrasing, but I loved his answer. It was something like, um, what makes you think that my credibility as, you know, a niche jazz artist is more important than putting food on the table for my family? <laughs> It's like if that's what being a sellout is, then fine. Call me a yeah. sellout. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Give me give me more of that. Yeah. I, I just I love, love these canned, pre preconceived, loaded questions that interviewers ask. It's like the it's like the guy that asked Angus Young, how do you respond to uh how do you respond to critics that say that you've made the same album 12 times and angus goes that's a bloody fucking lie we made the same album 13 times <laughs> you know oh yeah i do what i do <laughs> and i do it better than anybody on the planet what the hell more do right. you i dare i dare you <laughs> to, to make an album like it's like i always say i always think of stevie ray vaughn this way it's like whenever you hear him play a solo like if you know his playing at all you know what lick he's gonna play next before he plays it every single time but he's so damn good and so great at it that you're always like okay now do it again <laughs> yeah yeah okay but okay okay so now do how it again you know he, how you know he's great at it besides that it thrills you to listen to it mm -hmm. is that it it spawned a whole a whole legion of also rans that got a nickname that you can't be a Steve Ray Vaughn also ran anymore because you will be tagged with this the Steve label. Ray Vaughn be <laughs> a hat and strat dude. Oh, another hat and strat guy. You can't Billy Man. Corgan. Billy Corgan <laughs> talked about this in an interview once years ago where he was talking about um you know the impression of what you do and how how what you do is to be compared with what somebody else does or you know and he just lit into the guy and he says look i do what i do i'm not ingwe nobody else is ever going to be an uh, ingwe ingwe is ingwe and there's only one ingwe and there's only ever going to be one ingwe 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 Ingve. Wingnut and, Nangelstein. Yeah. There's only going to be one of those. And the minute that you try to beat him, it's fruitless. You could even play Paganini faster than he could. And you're just, you're still going to be an Ingve Vonnebe because Ingve did it first. Yeah. The gig's already filled. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. So yeah. we don't need any more Hatton Strat guys. We had right. one, the best one. That's why he was the best. And um, man, I remember going down to Austin, you know, and, and, you know, even 15 years later after, I don't know if it's still this way, but you know, um, like every other bar, there's some dude in there with a power trio, low strung slat strat playing through a vibra verb or a super or something doing that thing. Um, I, I want, but we need to do more questions. Go on, shoot. Simon, my man Simon, uh, he wants to know any plans to bring back a three-channel head? 
I uh, yeah, we've we've discussed that and current time schedules permitting logistics permitting completion of projects in the queue permitting that's next so hang in there we're we're getting there okay uh okay oh here we go um interesting question steve will you ever add uh 3xl t-shirts on your site i'm a bigger guy and the smaller shirts make me look like an 80s bodybuilder <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, t-shirts are a funny thing. Uh, first of all, we're like falling on our ass and keeping up with t-shirt requests. And um, uh, it's just what when we put together an order of t-shirts, I don't actually do that. The person that does manages that uh, kind of when we go to a t-shirt supplier, you know, they, we have to have a certain mix and a certain quantity of sizes and you know it's, it's sort of based on what we normally sell right you know so um if we if we don't have a particular size it's because we never get asked for it and now we've been asked for it so the thing to do is um is to go um the the thing to do is just send a, um, an email to sales at fryette.com and say i need a triple x damn it i want um, i want my triple x riot t-shirt and gimme 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 and we'll make it happen awesome uh brendan i see this you should demo the ether joe oh, i'm gonna demo the ether i definitely yeah. want to demo the hell out of the ether so that's yeah. coming yeah um seventh seventh string heaven asks where did the deliverance name come from i want to know that actually is it delivering me from evil or to evil? <laughs> um, that was that was a gift. That was just handed to me. Um, we were talking about uh, we were talking about what this amp was going to be, and actually, the the genesis of the deliverance was actually sprang from. The big fat ass amp. Uh, what is the big fat ass amp? The big fat ass amp was the Leslie West signature amp that he wanted us to make for him and name it the big fat ass amp. That was and going to be the name, really? That was going to be the name. He wanted wow. it to be called the Leslie West big fat ass amp. Okay. Because that's when he played through it. He went, that's a big fat ass amp. And he called me the week after I met him at NAM after playing a gig with it where he fucking slayed. And he goes, yeah, it's Leslie. Yeah, I've been thinking about this. I want you to make this amp. And I want you to call it the big fat ass something. Big fat ass. It's got to have big fat ass in it or fat ass something. So imagine, ass. so imagine if Leslie had played the the first, uh, the hot rotted Princeton thing that Randy was doing instead of Carlos back then. It wouldn't have been Mesa Boogie. It would have been Mesa Fat Ass. <coughs> <coughs> You guys know that whole story about the boogie yeah. and Mesa boogie? Yeah. Came from yeah. Carlos saying, yeah, yeah that's amp really yeah. boogies. Yeah. Well, if you look at the first the first few hundred, uh, the whole first series of deliverance boards inside, the board model number is BFA 100, 120, really? BFA 60. Yeah. Oh, wow. Because they were originally going to be the big fat ass amp. And, uh, uh, it was actually going to be a two channel amp and then it didn't work out dealing with him and it got sidelined and um it was it was actually um we've talked about what the genesis of the the mission of the deliverance ended up what we wanted it to, to be the video that you just made of interviewing me we, we talked about where that came from and and why mm -hmm. so um how did it become the name Deliverance? We were just sitting in a meeting room one day and and talking about what it what it's going to be called and blah 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 blah. And I was just like, I just heard that word in my head and I went, Deliverance. And everybody just stopped talking and went, you could hear a pin drop in the room. And the conversation about 
what to call it, stopped dead right there. Nobody said, no, I don't think so. It should be maybe something else. Everybody just stopped and shut up, and that was the end of the conversation. And that awesome. became the deliverance. And all the all the um, all the the movie jokes about it that that ensued afterwards. Nobody even remotely thought any, of any relationship to the movie or anything like that. It just it just came like this. Came out of my mouth. Everybody went. The meeting stopped cold. Yeah. Oh, that's what it's called. Okay. It's like we're all done here. Let's go have yeah. lunch. Nice. Uh, okay, next question. Uh, MC80. Oh, that's a nice uh, question. Uh, he's asking to, to both of you, how does it feel to give other musicians the gift of joy and inspiration? You're both awesome. Thank you both. Well, thank you. Thank my mom. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's what I do. That's what I do. I tell her, you know, uh, will be in a car or something or see something on TV, some band, some really aggressive <laughs> band, you know, using our gear. And my mom will say something like, what's that? And I go, you made That's that That's Sumac. <laughs> it came from yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. I said, you made that happen. And I tell everybody that you made that happen. And she goes, oh, she goes, well, thanks, I guess. <laughs> that's hilarious, but that's a beautiful thing. I put it all on her. I said, see, yeah. if you hadn't have if you hadn't have done what you did, none of this would have been happening, and all these people would have been deprived of the ability to do that. And she's like, Well, I guess that's a compliment. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> How you would expect. But she's very proud. Uh, of all of that and uh so I, I give it i give it all i give it all to her i'm looking at my thing here and i'm the mirror image has got me screwed up yeah I, I look at that kind of thing as it's just like um you know it's one big sort of cycle or uh you're just passing it around you know mm -hmm. i love being inspired i'm inspired every day by all sorts of people doing all sorts of amazing things and it's it's fun to be able to contribute to that to some people and you know even just tiny little ways um you know i i don't know what the hell i'm doing i play guitar i try and be a decent person that's it you know so if, if i contribute positively just a little bit then i feel good about it and i love you know just receiving it from other people too so that's what it is. It's just handing it off like a hot potato. You know, <laughs> here's some inspiration. Sweet. Here, you be inspired now. <laughs> I did my little thing. And then it comes back around. So uh, let's see here. <laughs> oh, this is a funny comment. This is from Brendan. Reinhold seems like enough of a nutcase to where Steve and he could either come up with something great together or completely clash. Oh, you guys would that would be really interesting uh we we've never we've we've never clashed Reinhold and i've never clashed he comes up to me and he tells me that my ideas are too outlandish are uh, seriously that's funny yeah mm. he's just it's like he looked at the memphis and he goes see that's your problem that's your problem you're like you're trying too hard I'm trying too hard. Excuse me. Uh, he's actually giving you a compliment in there, though. <laughs> Reinhold's awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, he Reinhold owes me because I fished him out of a dumpster down in the warehouse district in L.A. after a, a bout of drinking at Al's bar, where he was so hammered <laughs> that he climbed into a dumpster and passed out. And I saw him, and I dragged him out of the dumpster and drove him home. So oh, I'm on. personally responsible for every amp he made after that, because if I hadn't have done that, he could have ended up in the back of a dump truck and then buried at a landfill somewhere. So I personally take responsibility for every amp and product that he's put out. He owes me royalties for every one of them. I think uh, <laughs> you, you, you got to tell Nico Chan about that. Oh, she knows about it. 
Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. That's as far as people who are, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, his tolerance for alcohol was way, way higher than anything that I could imagine. Uh, okay, well, guys, we're um, we're getting towards that magical time where we should wrap it up. I think we got through most of the stuff, if not everything. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think we uh, can we get Steve to play some tunes as we close out the show. Well, we'll think about it. Uh, one thing I didn't get to talk about, and maybe we can just talk about it later, is like I've, one of the things that happened this week is I got my I got the neck on my Esquire reworked by a good friend of mine, um, Bruce Nelson of Nelson Guitars. He's also Dean DeLeo's guitar tech, and um, he took what was like already my favorite and most longest standing in- instrument of choice, and and made it and made it much more playable so um and uh just a, a plug for him um i played uh, one of his guitars a few weeks ago um he happened to be at the fryat shop when i stopped by and uh what was that thing it was like a it was that like a blue junior number. yeah it was wow. like a junior, a junior shaped body with uh, with a uh, humbucker humbuckers in it and yeah that was when, special that was special yeah. that's one of those guitars that uh you know, every once in a blue moon, somebody hands me a guitar. No, I, uh, oh, something's happening over there. Um, I can tell as I'm, I'm grabbing the guitar, something about mm. just the weight. Like, oh, I think this is going to be special. Like, I haven't played a note on it. I haven't even had it in playing position yet. And sure as hell, yeah, that, that guitar is something else. The, the, <laughs> the neck is... Uh, super comfortable yeah yeah and uh he brought over a similar one he brought over a similar similar one on friday with a single pickup and it was just as awesome the main guitar so uh oh (laughs) what we got here <laughs> is, what, what is that? Is that an anvil song? I shame on you. <laughs> you don't know the the Godfather of heavy metal. I know what song you're playing. That's you, that's dude. Ronnie James Dio. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I know that jam. Actually. You know who's re- you know who's uh, remixing that record right now? I don't know. Joe Barisi, he's got Ooh. that record. Uh huh. Holy well, Nico Chan, welcome back to the show. I haven't seen you for a while. How are you? Um, what do you got there? Good. Oh, well, are you guys drinking stuff. So I'm I'm drinking. All right. Yeah. All right. So let's uh, let's have a let's have a drink with Nico Chan. <laughs> Get the little mini. <laughs> yeah, try to pace yourself there, will you, girl? That's good. Yeah, I love, I love bubble. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Nikochan is, uh, uh, Nikochan is the uh, character, uh, the Japanese version of the doobie from. Uh, the 50s and 60s children's show Romper Room. Hello, everybody. Romper Room had the doobie that sang the song for kids to do the right thing and not do the wrong thing called Do Be a Doobie and Don't Be a Don't Be. Right. And um, that TV show was syndicated internationally and showed up in a Japanese version of romper room uh and the doobie character's name is nico chan and nico chan has a different version of the doobie song that she would like to recite for you should, right should now I sing it? sure please okay nico nico Nico-chan, it's more 
こちゃんって、はい<笑> !Well, <笑> thank you. Thank you. you. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I've been drinking too much. Oh,、uh, well, we yeah, all. Yeah, but you, you, had some, you had some groove and soul in that version, man.、Really? Well, I, I think I drink too much. <laughs> 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 Isn't that a daily thing, though?、Uh, sorry, I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. Welcome back.、Okay. Well, so today is、uh, um, what? Question day, right? It has been question day. We've had a lot of、oh, great questions. All right. So、um, I have a question, you two guys,、um, maybe to the audience, too. You know, this is like a music show, right? Like, you, you guys. Occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> gear, gear geeks,、um, talking about the gears.、Um, I have a, a non gear、um, question. Great. Yeah. But, you know, music related. And we've been drinking.、Um, I, should, I shouldn't say drinking,、um, enjoying alcohol. <laughs>、right? so, um, but enjoy too much, then、um, maybe any kind of stupid experience, a mistake, or、um, in, 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 you know, any,、uh, ash, like you don't want to talk about it, but today you can share. Yeah. Any stupid、yeah. experience or mistake. Yeah, like, but it h a v e to be a、uh, uh, music related. Like, you guys,、um, you know, like after a concert or going to,、uh, um, I don't know, like a rehearsal or anything. Like,、um, get together with the other musician people and, and, Drink too much and had a stupid、uh, experience. Well, that, that experience with Reinhold, I mean, that, that kind of counts. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that kind of stuff. You know, I had a,、um, <clears throat> I、uh, lost my memory three times in my life. You blacked out? Yeah. <laughs> the, the reason happening was about two weeks ago. Ooh. Yeah, you know, Steve, right?、Um, you play at the Greek theater two, three, four, year, four weeks ago? I don't remember. A few、mm. weeks ago, right? Four weeks ago, yeah. Yeah, after that,、um, I think I was enjoying too much of that show and I, I, I had too much、uh, wine and I was drunk so much and I don't remember. I know that I was cussing you at the restaurant. <laughs> I was, that word at the restaurant was really loud, wasn't it? I, sorry, Steve, I don't remember any of t h a t We were in the green room at the Greek after the show, and, and Nico chan was trying to get a decent glass of wine. And yeah, I, don't, I don't want to, to stand up the, my sheet. You know, the going through the people in front of the other people because people enjoy the show. So I asked、uh, um, the guy at the bar, said, I want to order、uh, two g l a s s of wine in one cup, please. And the guy was nice enough that instead of giving me a, a, a two c u p of wine、uh, in a one cup, he used a.、Um, He used a pint beer pint, cup,、yeah. filled it full、and、of wine. He, he filled for me. So I think、uh, I. I, I think so you had a、wine. pint? You had a pint of wine? Almost pint. You know, guy was really nice. In the solo cup? Yeah. Yeah. And then afterwards, we went to a restaurant. Restaurant, and, and then I don't remember anything. Had a couple of shots of tequila. <laughs> I don't remember anything. And I was a star casting Steve. Fuck you! Fuck you, Steve! Fuck! Fuck you! But I don't remember any of those. I'm sorry, Steve. And then after the, after the restaurant, of course, I didn't drive the car, but、um, I, was, I was blasting music, right? The plane. Yeah, she was, she was cussing me out、uh, at the restaurant to the point where 
the bartender is starting to look over and everything okay over there and and then after we left she like snapped from being wigging out for i don't know what reason to putting a status quo on the radio at full blast with this big smile on her face singing along with down down going down 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 it was the riot of a night i but I don't remember any. <laughs> don't remember any of it. I don't remember anything. Sorry. <laughs> so, anything like that? You guys have any? Uh, uh, you know, I, 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 about the five, six years ago. No, it's more than ten years ago. I broke the tailbone. Also, that time I don't remember. Also, uh, that was like a helmet concert, right? Yeah, it was a helmet concert. And I, I drink too much of Jaeger bomb and. <laughs> And I was found in the bathroom with the pants down the ankle, uh, wasn't it? After six Jaeger bombs, yeah, you'd be like in the in the bathroom, passed out with your pants yeah, around your ankle. I don't remember that either. And then uh, that night, I broke the tailbone. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> so, you guys, do you guys have anything like that? Nothing that beats that. <laughs> <laughs> What do you got, Joe? <laughs> Man, like I, I stay away from drinking when I play, but for some reason, for some reason, when you ask that question, this is the thing that popped into my head. This was forever ago. I was, this was like back in the days before I was really playing for money. I think I was playing at a party. And there's this guy. I, I wonder if he's still walking the earth. He was such. He was al alcoholically challenged. We'll just say that. Like even when we were really young, and his name was Alan Jack. And I remember, like I, I wasn't playing music, but I, I watched him walk out of the bathroom, and he's just hammered. He can barely stand up, and he sneezes, and it like stops him in his tracks. He sneezes once, and then he touches his nose. <laughs> This is disgusting. <laughs> and there's like snot on his hand, right? And then he sneezes again and like <laughs> more and more of this comes out. And he he keeps getting <laughs> Gross. on his hands. And he he <laughs> so he's drunk and he's having the sneezing fit. <laughs> All of this snot is coming out and covering his hands. And I'm watching this happen. <laughs> and I'm also watching this group of girls who are watching this happen. And they're all just like in real time, you can see them going, ew. And he, <laughs> and he can't stop sneezing. And he can't comprehend what's happening to him until he's just like standing there <laughs> in a pile of like, there's not one bit of his hands that's not covered in snot that's also like stuck to his face. <laughs> wow, this is going down hard <laughs> fast. Sorry, you asked. Uh, <laughs> and that's what I don't, I don't my know head. if I, I don't know if I can top that. The, the, the most insane thing that I can think of. Funniest was thing I ever saw. When I turned 21, which was in Fairbanks, Alaska. And, um, we went, it was our night off at the gig, and we went downtown to where the other band that we had befriended, it was their night. We went down to see them play their gig on our night off and went there. And I was drinking tequila and celebrating my birthday. So I was drinking shots. And in Fairbanks, it was like you the, you started playing at 9 o'clock and finish playing at four o'clock in the morning or something. But your, your birthday's in January, right? Yeah. So we were so in Fairbanks last year. Bridget. Yeah. It was minus yeah. 30 degrees outside. And uh, I was so hammered. I was, I had so much antifreeze in me that I'm walking down the street in Fairbanks at four o'clock in the morning in jean cutoffs and flip flops and a tank top. And I had a scarf around my mouth so that I wouldn't inhale frozen air and freeze my lungs. But the whole rest of me was was antifreezed out. And uh, so we went to the we went to the other bar and drank, started drinking. They started pouring me champagne. And then one guy says, uh, 
Um, so Scott, you had a similar thing. So this guy comes up and says, you got to try this. And he says, what is it? He says, oh, it's wild turkey. What's wild turkey? Well, try it and you'll see. So I drank a shot of wild turkey. And then I don't remember anything after that. But what I heard was that I was passing out, being dragged to the restroom about every 20 minutes. And after that, getting hosed down in the kitchen of the restaurant after going into and being violently ill in the restroom, they hauled me into the kitchen and hosed me down because I had wow. vomiting all over myself. And, oh, and man. then when I came out, when I came out after that, I was screaming at everybody. It was the fucking wild Turkey. I was fine until that shot of wild Turkey. <laughs> Six oh, shots so you of, and Scott do have some six shots of tequila, two bottles of champagne, but it was the fucking wild turkey. Right. God damn right. it, that's what did it, you guys. And right. I was apparently screaming that at everybody. <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't really there, but that's that that's what I heard. Oh man. Well, everybody well, has a stupid uh, experience with the alcohol. Right? Oh, yeah. Those are those are just some of the highlights, but um, we decided that we would wrap up with that and bring back Nico Chan because we hadn't seen you for a while and we miss you and we love you. Thank you. Thank and it's you so nice to have me. you back. Thank you for having me again. Um, Come back well, again you know, soon. Yeah, if I have any other questions, I'll be back and and ask you guys. So. That does it for us tonight. Thank you all you guys for joining us and hanging out, especially hanging out this far. Uh, and great questions. And thank you for the lovely comments and compliments. We appreciate it all. Uh, thank you, Nico Chan. Thank You're you, welcome. Joe. Thank you. Uh, stay tuned for more demo vids, for more photographs, for more uh, episodes of the Malcontents. And um, we're going to start doing a product release information about a new product that's actually going to hit the streets very soon now that a lot of people have been asking it about. That's happening. And then whatever mayhem goes on between now and the next two-week period that we can talk to you about next time, we'll get to the guitars that I had worked on. And we've got some other interesting, fun, super, super, super geeky, geeky, nerdy amp stuff to show you and demonstrate. Definitely. So uh, stay tuned for the next show. Thanks again. Have a lovely rest of your weekend. And nice. Joe, you want to take us out? Yeah, I'm going to press play. We're out, guys. Thanks so Cheers. much for joining us. See you next time. Bye.